Uh, We're continuing our study through the book of Luke, and in the previous couple weeks, uh, we've seen Jesus resist the devil. We've seen him exercise wisdom over, you know, the the religious institutions, the religious leaders. Uh, We've seen Jesus preach with power in Nazareth. We've seen Nazareth's rejection in his hometown. Um, This morning, we're going to see Jesus demonstrate power over both the natural and the supernatural world. And if you thought that the scripted Super Bowl was going to be exciting today, I promise you what you learn from Jesus today is going to be far more spectacular than, than anything that you will see on TV. Much more beneficial for your life as a believer for sure. But listen, Luke wants to prove to us that Jesus is the Son of God. And he's, if Jesus is the Son of God, then he's got to demonstrate power over every dimension of life. And that is what Jesus begins to do in his ministry. So we're going to start off in Luke 4, 31. Uh, It's a great platform, great context uh, for us. It says this. It says, Then he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee. In Matthew 11, 1, we're told that Jesus departed from there to preach and teach in their cities. At the end of this passage in Luke, it uh, tells us that Jesus says, I must preach the kingdom of God in, it, uh, in other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. Jesus went around from city to city preaching the kingdom of God. Capernaum became the surrogate home for Jesus after Nazareth's rejection. Later in Luke, we find that Capernaum, although being close to Jesus, just like Nazareth, they rejected him. In Luke 10, 15, it, uh, Jesus is recorded saying, You, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You will be brought down to Hades. And Jesus' words came to fruition because that city eventually became so destroyed that its exact whereabouts were still debated until recent, recent history. But Capernaum was a significant city, and uh, significant enough that the Romans actually stationed a Roman centurion there. Um, you know, they had a, it was a soldier or officer, had a hundred guards. Um, Luke 7 tells us that he must have been there for some time because he built a synagogue there. He might have even built this one. John 4.46 tells us that there was a royal official that made his home there, um, probably somebody that served Herod Antipas. But it was a significant place. It was a significant town. And Capernaum was known as a manufacturing center of Palestine. There was a lot of fishing business there. There was a lot of mill grinding there. And so it was, it was strategically located, right? And it was always flooded with these merchants that came from all over the Roman Empire. Major roads would have crossed through its, its town, connecting cities like Damascus and Jerusalem, Tyre and Sidon and Syria. Um, and there would have been a, lo- a road leading to the Mediterranean Sea. And so the city would have had a lot of pagan influences from all over the Roman Empire. And this would have been a perfect place to minister to both Jews and Gentiles. And so it was an ideal location for, you know, Jesus to set up a headquarters to spread the gospel. Capernaum is also where we see uh, Peter and Andrew move from Bethsaida. And they move there to grow that fishing business of theirs. Uh, We also see that Matthew, or Levi, the tax collector, was from Capernaum. He had a booth set up in that city. And so Capernaum, you know, is going to be Jesus' home base. A lot of the stories in the New Testament take place in Capernaum. And many of his disciples were called from there. But in Luke 4.31, the other other half of 31 and 32 says, Jesus was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word was with authority. You know, once again, Jesus' words had convicting power. When Jesus heard, or when people heard Jesus, they were shocked. They were amazed. They were astonished. You know, nobody heard anybody speak like Jesus before. He spoke with this authority that Luke says, right? His teaching was powerful. It was true. It was delivered with clarity, with conviction. It provoked response from people, right? One way or another. And the people, they were used to hearing rabbis give their interpretations of scripture, giving their opinions of what they thought the scriptures meant. But Jesus was different because his authority comes from him being the son of God. All right, he knew exactly what the scriptures meant. And when he delivered that message with boldness and confidence, people were awestruck. Israel hadn't seen a a preacher like him or John the Baptist for a very long period of time, 400 years. 
And I don't know how many people that you have in your life that you can take at face value, believing everything that they say is 100% true and accurate. Probably not many. But the people of Capernaum, when they heard Jesus speak, they knew they were hearing somebody with that type of authority that came from um, somebody who had, you know, that type of integrity, that type of honesty in their words. You know, and the, and the people's reaction kind of demonstrates that to us. And so as a principle for God's people, you know, people might not respond in amazement to our testimonies, right? They, they, they won't, might not be astonished by uh, the words we speak when we share the gospel about our faith. But as Christians, we need to strive for that type of honesty and integrity and humility and clarity in our words, you know, knowing that we speak in the name of God. You know, the, 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 that's confidence for us as believers. That's boldness that we can have when we witness because we know it's not our authority, right? We know it's not our witness that's going to have an impact on that person's life. Ultimately, the Lord does the work in his spirit, right? But Christ uses our lives, right? He uses our, 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 our stories and our testimonies to reach people. And so we need to... to, to connect with people with that type of humility and integrity. But moving on, Luke 4.33 says here, Now in the synagogue there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon. And so these next couple of verses, they're going to open up the floodgates for a lot of bad theology. Okay, a lot of false doctrine. Uh, many have been led astray in the Christian faith uh, towards charismatic, towards mystical, towards apostate Christianity. Um, and there's going to be time, more time to dive into these subjects with more critical study um, as we review and come up on this uh, theme of, of demon possession over and over in Luke. But for now, I want to touch base on a few things. Um, this is one of the first miracles that Luke records in his gospel. And Jesus' uh, authoritative teaching and the astonishment of the people here, it prompted this outburst from this man who had an unclean spirit. This demon couldn't contain himself in the presence of the Most High God. You know, demons throughout history, they, they've primarily been silent, right? They don't want their work to be seen. They hide behind the scenes. And they work subtly to not be noticed. But when faced with Christ, they can't help but expose themselves. The truth is that, you know, there are spiritual influences that are roaming this earth seeking to alter the trajectory of man's eternity. And they hide themselves in every facet of a person's life. In the New Testament, it reveals to us some bizarre behavior in the spiritual realm associated with demons and demon possession. But demon possession in the Bible is never confused with insanity. Okay, the demons were always rational when they spoke. They understood who Jesus was. You know, there's an example in uh, Acts 19:15, where these Jewish exorcists were trying to mimic Paul's ministry and trying to exorcise a demon out of a, a out of a person. And they say, you know, I recognize Jesus. I know about Paul, but who are you, right? You know, these 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 spirits are not horned creatures. They're not these floating mists in a cemetery. They're not weird sounds coming from your walls, okay? If you hear that, don't call on God. Call on a uh, game construction, you know? <laughs> but listen, you know, 16 times in the Bible, in the Gospels, demons are mentioned, inhabiting people. It's described by the phrases, entered him, or cast out, or come out, or coming out. And they were coherent, rational spiritual beings that take up residence in unbelievers' lives to control them. Thirteen times the Bible mentions the people being demon-possessed, mentions demoniacs. It says that they're afflicted by unclean spirits or they have unclean spirits. And it's, it's not something that can be explained physically. It's not something that can be explained psychologically. It's a spiritual phenomenon. And it's important to note that in every instance of demon possession, there was no reference to forgiveness of sins, okay? There's no indication that those were, who were delivered, who ever repented or believed in the gospel. They're, they're, these people aren't necessarily described as more evil or wicked than other sinners. 
In fact, there's some children that were actually demon-possessed. But in every case where these demons are, are the, 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 the point is that the emphasis here on why these narratives are in the Bible is that Jesus was demonstrating his power. Okay? He's going to demonstrate his ability to deliver people from the enslavement and control of dark spiritual forces. And it's a witness that validates his authority, right? The, the message that he preached. But in every case where these demons were confronted, they lost their power. God limited what the spirits were able to do. And in Jesus' time, God allowed these demons to be very active so that Jesus would demonstrate his power over them. Look at Luke 33 here. Uh, 33b through 34, it says, And he cried out, that's this demons, cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. You know, in the middle of the Lord's message here, this demon felt the presence and the power of God, right? Invading earth. This is the, the kingdom of the demons. And here he is con being confronted and this demon panics and he shouts out basically saying like, why are you attacking us? And the demons, you know, they're described in the Bible as angels of light. They don't want to be exposed, especially here in God's house, right? This is a synagogue we're at or even in church. But this is where they're operating in silence, pretending to be religious, swaying people from the truth. And it's amazing to me sometimes how churches will avoid, you know, uh, non-selvific issues or secondary doctrines, right? As to not ruffle feathers as if they're things that are too hard to understand in Scripture. You know, I'm going to give you a little spoiler alert here. I'm going to ruffle some feathers and you may have to clean up my mess, Pastor. But, you know, I'm, I don't want to shy away from things in the Bible because they're hard to understand or, or there's differences of opinion. You know, I, I, I get it. We're flawed, right? I'm flawed. Our understanding is not fully realized yet until we get to heaven and we, we're going to know all these things. But here in the scriptures, it's clear that a lot of these demons have a better theology of God than most Christians. You know, the first thing I'm going to mention here is that this demon recognizes that Jesus is the second person in the Trinity. Right? He calls him the Holy One of God, Jesus of Nazareth. Later on in this passage, we're going to see those demons being exercised and they're, they're crying out, you're the Christ, you're the Son of God. I mean, they know that, that, that Jesus has authority over them, that he's Lord, that he's sovereign. But what is fascinating to me here, too, is the fact that they understood that they were on borrowed time. Right? And this demon's confused as to why Jesus is here now. Like, is he here to bring the judgment, right? Is Jesus here to, to destroy that demon army like God said he would? The demon's terrified because he knows who Jesus is, and he knows what it means for him to be confronted by Jesus. That word destroy there translates apolemi in the Greek, and it means to bring to nothing, to abolish, to bring to an end. The demons have, have been sentenced to an eternal torment in hell for their rebellion against God. And they're awaiting that punishment right now. And this demon here, he thought he was receiving that sentence, like right here, right now. He thought he was going to be cast away. Turn your Bibles to Revelation 20, 1 through, 1 through 3. It says, uh, says this, it says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan. And he bound him for a thousand years and he cast him into the bottomless pit. And he shut him up and he set a seal on him so that he should not deceive the nations no more till a thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. After the uh, tribulation period in the end times, Jesus is going to reign for a thousand year period. That's what this scripture says. This is what we refer to as the millennium. And during this time, Satan and the demons are going to be uh, the ones that are remaining here on earth. They're going to get together 
and, and they're going to be placed in this abyss during that thousand years, this pit. And I'll admit that there are several interpretations of what this is, and I encourage every one of you to investigate it yourselves. Um, but the view that I'm going to share this morning is the oldest historical view of Judaism and Christianity. Um, it, it's it's uh, uh, confirmed by extra biblical sources like the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, the, the Septuagint, which is the earliest Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, um, the Book of Enoch, which is referred to in epistles in the New Testament. Um, they were also uh, confirmed in the writings of like Philo and Josephus, um, early church fathers like Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian, Origen, they held this view. But most importantly, this view is supported and substantiated by scripture, by the apostles, and, and by the Hebrew syntax or the Hebrew language. And that's that this abyss was established when the demons left their realms and disturbed God's order when they cohabitated with humans in Genesis 6. Which is the only mention of demons in the Old Testament, by the way. And it's why God had to destroy a tainted race of humanity. Genesis 6 speaks about the sons of God entering the daughters of men. That phrase, the sons of God, is, is never uh, referred to in the Old Testament to, to human beings. It's always referred to angels. And you can read more about this in Genesis 6, but 1 Peter 3, 18, 20 kind of reiterates this position. And, and Peter says this, he says, Christ also suffered once for sins the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Okay, so we're, we're talking about a time when Jesus was on the cross. His, his flesh is, is dead, right? He's on the cross or in the tomb, but his spirit is alive. And in verse 19, Peter says, he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Okay, and this, the word spirits here is pneuma. It's always referred to spiritual beings. So there are spiritual beings in prison. Why are they there? Who are they, right? These are, these are ones, in verse 20 it says, who were formerly disobedient when the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah. Okay, this is a reference to Genesis 6. And during those three days Jesus was in the, uh, was, uh, in the grave, he went down, his spirit went down to this pit where these demons were locked up and he proclaimed to them his victory over evil and death. This same thought is reiterated again in Jude 6. It's in Jude 6, it says this, it says, the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of that great day. And this is all in context to, to, to Noah. But those demons, they've been locked up for this terrible, egregious sin since Noah. And the ones remaining, they don't want to go there. Okay? They enjoy their liberties for a time, corrupting the people on the earth. And like Adam, you know, a lot of people, unfortunately, are entertaining these angels. This darkness. Later on in Luke's gospel, Jesus removes a demon called Legion. You guys might be familiar with this story in Luke. We're going to get to it. But this demon begged Jesus that he would not command them to go into the abyss or to the pit. Same place that we're talking about. And so together, the demons who are chained, the ones who are loose now, at the end of the millennial period, they're going to be released. They're going to have this one last uh, concerted effort to overthrow God, and they're going to fail. That's what we just read in Revelation 20, and it tells us that they're going to be thrown into the lake of fire where they're going to undergo eternal punishment. All that to say this, okay? The demons remaining here on earth, they understand Jesus' words. They understand the scriptures in a literal, grammatical, historical, plain sense in which they were written. And their hermeneutics are sound. They're, they're, they're premillennialists in their, in, their, in their eschatology, right? But listen, unlike atheists, unlike liberal theologians, unlike uh, apostate churches or cultic religions like Mormonism or Jehovah's Witness or even Islam, they, they have this unsubstantiated 
right? An incredible version of Jesus. But the demons, they know exactly who Jesus is. And they're compelled to confess that he is the Holy One of God. So important. And Luke establishes Jesus' credentials here by showing that even the evil spirits recognize him as the Messiah, as the Son of God. Now listen, Jesus had to rebuke them. In Luke 4.35, it says this. Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet, come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him in their midst, it came out of him and it didn't hurt him. And Jesus shows here his, his, his superiority over this demon, right, over the demonic realms. He commands that demon to, to shut up, come out of the man, right? Even in a, in a world that seems like it's in absolute control by Satan, Jesus reveals that he has more power. In 1 John 3, 8, it says, For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. And this demonstration of power over the, the demon, it revealed his ability to, to deliver sinners from the grasp of darkness, to retrieve a man from even the most saturated evil. And Jesus stops the acknowledgement of this evil spirit he didn't want this evil spirit witnessing about his identity, about his deity. You know, this would have been a false witness. Uh, it would have been a profession only, right? This demon wouldn't have confessed Christ from the heart. He wouldn't have a desire to follow Christ. I mean, demons can't be born again, nor do they want to. There's no redemption for them. The only confession that Jesus accepted was a confession from a man who, who made a deliberate decision to follow him as Lord. Romans 10, 9 and 8 says, or 10, 9 and 10 says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. You know, Jesus may have wanted to keep this demon quiet also, too, to, to, to restrain enthusiasm, right, for, for a, a, a political messiah. He didn't want uh, to be king in the way that that the people desired him to be king. You know, he, he may have uh, avoided allowing them to, the demons to speak because, you know, they would have had a misunderstanding of the crucifixion. Like, Jesus doesn't want people to wildly proclaim that he's the son of God if they, if they don't understand what the meaning of his death on a cross means. And so despite the attacks of these demons, despite the attacks of Satan earlier we've seen in Luke 4 to derail Jesus' ministry, Christ effortlessly defeats them, right? Shut up, demon. He didn't need time. He didn't need tools. He didn't need spells and potions. When Jesus spoke, the demon obeyed. You know, one more thing before we see the people's response here. Nowhere in scripture is there a clear example of a demon ever inhabiting a true believer, okay? Never in the epistles are believers warned about the possibility of being demon-possessed, nor do we ever see uh, uh, the casting out, the rebuking, or the binding of demons by believers. The epistles are never to instruct uh, the, the epistles also never instruct believers to cast out demons, either from believers or unbelievers. In fact, the Bible says the very opposite. It says, flee from Satan. Create a divide between you and anything that is evil. You don't play with any of that stuff. Christ and his apostles were the only ones who ever cast out demons. And in every instance, they were unbelievers. Okay? And it was for this purpose of validating the message that they spoke. And so God's revelation, as it began to circulate through the apostles' letters, through the epistles, through, through the gospels, the miracles and signs, they begin to stop. And God's word is, is compiled here in, all, in the 66 books. is all that's necessary for salvation. Okay, it's important to know that. But Luke 44, 36 and 37 goes on. It says this, Then they were all amazed, and they spoke among themselves, 
saying, what a, what a word this is. For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And the report of him went out in every place in the surrounding region. You know, once again, Jesus' power, his authority, you know, testifies to his claims, and they're, they're captivated by this new teacher, right? They, he possesses power here that, that they've never seen. But it's so sad because these people, they didn't stick around long enough to hear what he was saying beyond that miracle. They didn't comprehend his words about the kingdom. And so Jesus moves on in Luke 4.38. It says, now he arose from the synagogue and he entered Simon's house. But Simon's wife's mother was sick with a high fever. And they made request of him concerning her. After Jesus is clashed with this demon in Capernaum, and Jesus is going to demonstrate his ability to heal the sick. Over the natural realm, he's going to show he's got power over that. You know, Jesus would have left the synagogue around noon. Mark's gospel tells us that along with James and John and Peter, they arrive at Peter's house uh, where he was living with his, his wife and his mother-in-law and his brother Andrew. And, you know, just as a little side note, this indicates to us Peter probably was still a member of that local synagogue. He wasn't quite called to be an apostle quite yet. But Peter, he may have been present in the synagogue to hear Jesus' remarkable teaching, right? And he, he, he would have heard God exp or Jesus explaining God's word, and, and he, he may have very likely been a witness to this Jesus removing this demon from this man. And so he invites Jesus over for a Sabbath meal. And it may have been that Peter had more in mind with this meal because when Jesus arrives to Peter's home, he finds a family in crisis. Peter's mother-in-law was very sick. The Gospels mention that she had a fever. And this is one of the insights that we get from Luke. You know, he's a doctor, right? He's a physician. And Luke describes it like this. He, she had a high fever. In the Greek, that's megaparitos, and it means a large or great burning fire of a fever, right? He's more exact with his, his description of that. But knowing Jesus' power, Peter, Luke says, made a request concerning her. You know, there's no comment on to what type of sickness she had. Um, you know, there was, uh, you know, malaria in that area around the mouth of the river of the, of the Jordan. Um, we don't know exactly, but... Peter's mother was critically ill. You know, she was desperately needful. She was overtaken by this fever and, and she was debilitated by this illness. And she was bedridden. She was so sick, she couldn't even ask for help from Jesus herself. And Peter, knowing Jesus' reputation for healing the sick, he places his confidence in Jesus to heal her. And so in Luke 4, 39, it says, So he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she arose and served them. Again, no tricks, no potions, no spells, no incantations. Just a word from the Holy One of God. And the sickness left her. And he rebuked the sickness, and it was removed. And Jesus healed Simon's Peter or Simon Peter's mother-in-law, so completely uh, of this sickness, uh, you know, it, it, it completely restored her. It, it, Luke says it, it, immediately she arose and served them, right? That Sabbath meal. Uh, she was healed so perfectly, it was like she was never sick. Like there was no recovery time, right? No rehab, no lingering issues. And the blessed woman that she is gets up and continues doing what she was probably prepping to do the days ahead. And Jesus heals her with a word, heals her instantly, heals her totally. You know, the physical effects of the fall, they're, they're universal and they're devastating. Birth is our first step towards death. And there's deformities along the way. There's illnesses, there's weaknesses, there's injuries, there's ailments. Ultimately, there's death. Right? And there's disease. And no human being escapes that. All of us, to some degree, more, some more than others, are affected physically and psychologically, emotionally, 
spiritually in this world. And we're hindered from becoming our true, perfect selves because of sin in this world. And this illustration by Jesus is it's just a small window in what God is going to do with all believers when we get to glory. You know, he's going to reverse that curse of death. And we're going to be given new bodies. We're going to be made perfect in heaven someday. Our physical limitations are going to be erased. When we're made in perfection and we're in the presence of God, we're going to have bodies that can contain that. And it's all because Jesus has the power to do so. He's the Lord over the spiritual realm and the natural realm. Everything obeys the command of his voice. And just like this uh, demon theology can get out of hand, so can people's understanding of healing too. Because too often churches, they build these doctrines of healing based on these special moments in history with Christ and his apostles. You know, these are descriptions of, of events that validate uh, the truth that was being preached. They're descriptions, they're not prescriptions for future ministry. You know, no faith healer can claim to heal like Jesus. All these aberrant churches doing healings on stages and, you know, they're, they're, just, they're unbiblical. They show no proof that they are doing what Jesus did. Jesus healed totally, instantly. He fully restored human beings with withered hands, gave them brand new ones. And even brought people back to life. And it's foolish for churches to go around chasing demons and doing exorcisms and pretending to heal people with a word from a false prophet who's just exploiting the hearts and minds of vulnerable and susceptible people. Jesus, the apostles, the 70 chosen by Christ to teach in the region, Barnabas and Philip, they were all given this ministry to heal after Christ ascended back to heaven. But it was to authenticate them as apostles of the Lord to verify the truth of their word. And they, like Jesus, they healed instantly, totally, healed anyone. They even raised people from the dead too. And you can read about that in the book of Acts. And so to claim that healing is a norm in the church undermines its unique role in authenticating Jesus and the apostles of revealers of divine truth. And keeping up with that purpose, you know, the healings, they subside in history as God's revealed word began to be written down for everyone. That apost ap apostolic era ended as the word became more accessible to everyone. The ministry, you know, wasn't given to keep believers healthy, right? There's times in the New Testament where Paul, uh, Epaphroditus, Timothy, Trophimus, they were all sick. None of them received any healings. Paul told Timothy to drink some wine for his stomach problems, right? And not only that, none of the New Testament epistles refer to a ministry of healing in the church, okay? There was no intention for these miracles to go beyond them. And I want to be re really clear in saying this too, that this by no means says that God cannot or will not heal somebody, okay? He can heal whomever he wants. He can intervene supernaturally in this world whenever he wants. But it's not the norm for the church to perform miracles and healing. We're to pray for God's will, to pray for each other's well-being, we're to pray for God's intervention, we're to have trust and faith in God's revealed word. I mean, we just did this earlier, opening up this service, right? There's power in prayer, and we pray for Charlotte and, and for God's intervention and healing to be done there. This, this is what the Bible prescribes. Luke 4, 40, 41 says, When the sun was setting, all those who had any that were sick with various diseases, they brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them, and he healed them. And demons also came out, many crying out, saying, You are the Christ, the Son of God. And he rebuked them and didn't allow them to speak, for they knew that he was the Christ. You know, naturally, after these 
two events, you know, people got excited. The word spread about Jesus everywhere, and everyone started bringing their afflicted to Christ. And he was healing them well into the night. And it says that Jesus laid his hands on every one of them. Jesus turned away nobody. He healed them all. Of sickness, of disease, and demons. You know, no matter how helpless, no matter how deformed, no matter how evil. Anyone who ever came to Jesus, he helped. Rich, poor, weak. The Lord forbid nobody in his presence. You know, think about this for a minute. Like, think of the, the times that you were the most loneliest in your life. The most darkest times in your life. You know, an illness, a loved one, went to be with the Lord, a broken relationship. You know, during those times, like, who helped you get through it? You know, maybe somebody comforted you with a word of sympathy. But probably it wasn't words at all, right? It was probably just the presence of somebody, right? A, 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 a simple touch of a friend, a hug, a loved one. I love a good fist bump. You know, I, I, I get you, right? I know what you're going through. Sometimes it's just a touch on somebody's hand to let them know you're there. Those simple wordless gestures are often the, 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 the most meaningful expressions of kindness and compassion that you can give to somebody. And Luke already notes here that Jesus has authority with his words, but Jesus here laid his hands on every one of them. Every one of them. Jesus was trying to illustrate to human beings throughout time, like, he's here personally for you. Personally. And he could have healed that whole group at once if he wanted, but he didn't. He chose to touch every single one of them. You know, it's a good example for us as believers who are the hands and feet of Christ. You know, we should be mindful to engage seeking people with this type of attitude, with this type of compassion and personal relationship. In Luke 4.42, it says, Now when it was day, he departed, and he went into a deserted place, and the crowd sought him and came after him, and he tried to keep him from leaving. You know, it's important to note here, Jesus never got so caught up in activity, even kingdom business, that he neglected his connection to the Father in heaven. Right? He was physically, mentally exhausted, drained. And we can probably understand that. He's been ministering here for almost 24 hours straight. It says this was the next day. But he made it a point to be refreshed by God, right? To have personal, alone, quiet time with God, to meditate on the things of God, to pray. He understood renewal. He understood strength to continue. His ministry comes from above, from the Father, and he's aligning himself with God and the people, on the other hand, here. You know, they, they never seen anything like this. And Jesus was doing this in every city. Uh, you know, he eradicated disease from the whole area of Galilee. And it's no wonder they didn't want him to leave. But unfortunately, as we're going to find out later, they, they were more interested in, in him providing physical things than hearing his message. And that's why Luke places Jesus' response here in 43 and 44. He says, But Jesus said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, because for this purpose I've been sent. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Galilee. Jesus stuck to his mission. Despite, you know, the pressures of, of some people trying to sidetrack him, he was focused. He was unwavering in his commitment, you know, to accomplish his mission. And he recognizes he has a, a purpose, a responsibility. His first obligation is to do the will of the Father in heaven. Everything else conforms to that one thing. Later in Luke 19, 10, Jesus says, For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. And that was the plan from the beginning of time. To bring people to a decision on Christ. To give them the opportunity to repent and believe his word or to allow them to reject that word and accept responsibility for their own sin when they stand before him in judgment. 
you know, the greatest miracle that we're shown here this morning is, is not that Jesus had power over demons. It's not that he had power over nature or, or biological matter or viruses or bacteria, any of that kind of thing. You know, the, but the greatest miracle is that he has power over sin's eternal consequence. He has the power to give life. It's a miracle to come to faith in God. But for that miracle to take place for every individual on this earth, repentance and faith has got to be placed in Jesus. Belief in his word. You know, to enter the kingdom of God is one of the greatest gifts, one of the greatest graces in this life. The greatest miracle anyone could ever experience, but it's up to the hearer of God's word to respond. You know, if you haven't placed your faith in Jesus in the king of the universe, we pray as a church that you would, even today. Church, um, now I thank you for being patient with me the last few weeks. I know I'm long-winded, and, but I do hope that uh, you found something worth digging into a little deeper in Luke 4. Let's pray. Church, with your head bowed, you know, I just want to give you a few moments alone in prayer. You know, if there are things that you want to pour out to God, you know, don't, don't hesitate to call on him this morning. You know, use those moments to ask him for help with whatever you're, you're going through. There's a story in the book of Mark where a man has got a son who's uh, afflicted by a demon. And... Um, you know, the, the man brings his son to Jesus and he's wanting Jesus to remove this demon. And Jesus tells him, you know, all things are possible if you believe. And the man's response is so honest. He says, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And so if you're going through anything hard, difficult this morning, I just pray that you would give that up to the Lord. He is capable of healing. He is capable of guiding you through whatever darkness you may find yourself in. God is there for you. Take a moment, please.